you know, uh, facilitate that with the M wave, which measures your HRV and tells you how coherent you are. Also, can measure how much of it you've got and so on. So, it's really a skill building device. But the real skill is learning to self regulate in the moment that we're, you're triggering. And the device facilitates that skill. So, it's not about walking around with an M wave all the time. Am I coherent? Am I coherent? <laughs> no, it's about practicing the skill so that you're develop, you're training your nervous system to where that coherent state is familiar. So that you can shift into it easier when you are in a challenging situation. The business meeting, the golf course, whatever. Make sense? Okay, so there's a number of skills we don't have time to get into today. Uh, but I'll tell you at the end how you can learn hard focus breathing. Uh, and it's not just a breathing technique, ease, quick coherent freeze frame, which is a really neat decision-making, intuition type tool, coherent communication, prepping, and so on. Uh, a lot of clinical health data. David said talk a little bit about the health stuff. So this is just a, there's about 80 published studies now uh, in both organizational and clinical settings. Uh, hypertension, blood pressure reduction, asthma, it's almost magical. I hate to use that word, but how effective coherence training is heart failure, increased functional capacity, and so on. Okay, I'm going to, Dave said that was okay to stretch you guys a little bit. <laughs> he did, so I'm warning you. So, talk a little bit about some of the research we've done, I call it the electrophysiology of intuition. And I'm going to tell you ahead of time, this is very rigorous stuff. Um, measuring brain waves and heart rhythms and skin conductance and all the stuff we do. So, what is that on his head? That's, these are electrodes. For EEG. Okay, so that's what he's headed there. So a little bit, little preference on intuition. There, are, the way I see it, there are three types. The main one, if you read most academic studies, and papers, and the thirty-five some books on intuition, almost all of them are limited to and grounded in what's called implicit knowledge or implicit learning. Most of you know what that means, right? No. Okay, implicit learning, implicit knowledge means that we learn something and don't didn't know we learned it, or learned it and forgot we learned it. Okay, it's just stored away back there in our unconscious. So we encounter a new problem. Don't have a, we don't have a solution. This is a new situation here. Hmm. So we ponder it. Usually when we're driving to work, not thinking about it, or in the shower, that unconscious processing seeps into the conscious mind, and aha, the insight, the intuition. I'm sure you've all had, it's very real. Sure, you've all had that happen, right? That's implicit knowledge, implicit learning. The other type is what I call energetic sensitivity, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And that's the real world, real time sensitivity that our nervous system has to environmental signals. Whether they're from another human, like empathy, reading somebody else's emotions, magnetic fields. Some people really are sensitive to electromagnetic fields, for example. And there are documented cases of people who can actually feel earthquakes coming. We now know we can measure changes in the Earth's magnetic fields prior to an earthquake. So some people's nervous systems are just tuned into that. It's real. It's measurable. Okay? So that's what I mean by energetic sensitivity. Or have you ever had that sense of somebody staring at you? You turn around, sure enough. How many of you have had that experience? Okay, energetic sensitivity. Okay? The third type is non-local intuition. These are the type of intuitive insights that you just cannot explain through implicit learning, these kinds of things. The mother who knows that her child just got hurt on the other side of the planet. Right? When the baby's in distress and so on. And not just women have this. So, I'm not going to go through, I don't have time to go through all the lab data, but what this and a number of studies have now independently shown, it's been duplicated in many labs now, and starting to be published in some of the major journals. Sometimes if a future event is sufficiently threatening, in other words, could cause harm to us or somebody we care about, and it's a key thing here, it has to be emotionally relevant to us. Okay? It causes a change in the heart's activity, and it literally starts with the heart. That pre-alerts us in the brain before the future event takes place. Okay? So I call it intuitive intelligence, and it clearly reacts faster than the mind can perceive. It bypasses that standard cognitive process. Anybody have any kind of personal examples of this, maybe? What I might be talking about? Silence. Hey, Roland. Yes. I've got a great example. Okay, great. Um, 
Oh, maybe I'll your mic down. One of my buddies, uh, I was actually a groomsman at his wedding, was a long-range patrol guy. Very well-trained, did things he can't talk about, <coughs> Central America kind of guy. And he, he told me, Dave, I was hiking near a marijuana plantation accidentally. He said, and someone lit me up in their sights. And I said, how the hell did you know that? It was nighttime. And he goes, oh, it's, it's obvious. We just know that. He said, when you're in the field, if someone has a gun pointed at you, like from a distance, he said, you feel a warm flush in your body. He said, I felt that I haven't felt it in years because you know, he's not in the military anymore. And he was absolutely certain it happened because they actually trained him to do that. So this is an example, very clear. You know, he knew he was in, oh God, there's pop plants here, I should get out of here, but he had, like, someone, I mean, someone cites a very precise thing that his neurology was trained for that the rest of us have no clue about. So we know when there are threats, but it's not conscious cognitive up here, it's down here. Great example. In law enforcement, military, I asked that question, and I can't get the eyes to shut up, I've got so many examples. <laughs> it's true, it's true. Um, but let me ask it this way, how many of you have been driving a car? Could be a road you've been down a thousand times before, hometown. For some reason, you slowed down before you went around a curve, over a hill, whatever. And sure enough, there was either a police car or a child running out in the street or an accident or something. If you had made that choice unconsciously, you would have probably been in trouble. See your hands, hands. How many of you have done that? Okay, there you go. It's another common example of this. We're able to show it in the lab. It's real. In fact, we're looking at the physiology. It's going to be stretchy for some of you, but it's absolute fact. We can predict with about 75%, 80% accuracy what the future event is going to be. Yeah. How is the information transmitted? How is the information transmitted? Where does it come from? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of things we can measure that we don't have the full theoretical understanding. Well, yeah, we have theories of this, but I'm not going to sit here and claim and say we, we know the, the how and where. But I can tell you that if we were talking quantum physics, no big deal. Experimentally proven and verified many times over. So it used to be thought that these kind of non-local, if you want to call them, or, or connected events like this were only true at the below the level of the atom, right, the quantum level. That's we've blown way past that now. I mean, they're they're doing they're showing these effects with whole atoms and groups of atoms now. Uh, we just did it physiologically before those experiments were done. The way I got that published in a scientific journal was to say that it looks like the heart and brain have access to a field of information that is not bound by the limits of time and space. Perfectly acceptable for peer-reviewed scientific journals. Okay? We're just showing it. I mean, it's, you know. So basically what I'm really saying is that we, the heart especially, has access to, every culture has their word for it, higher self, soul, spirit whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I know it's going to stretch some of you, but that's really what is going on. So as we become more coherent, we have more access to that higher, our higher capacities, that intuitive side of ourselves. Make sense? So we're training this. This is the Special Forces guys love to eat this up. Because basically we can't, you can train yourself to have access to more of that part of ourselves, that high speed of code of intelligence. Two couple, I don't have time to go into it, there's two key things. One of them is coherence being aligned. So, if we're gonna get, how you apply these techniques is really critical. Because you gotta really self-regulate. One, I asked you earlier how many have done the same dumb thing more than once, right? There are many situations that we go into that we know are gonna get us triggered in some way or other. You feel anxious about it. How many of you have business meetings? Yeah, does it feel like they take too long? Do you have too many of them? Yeah. Is there somebody usually in those meetings that you know it's going to act a certain way and do a certain thing that's just going to get you... Uh, yes? No? Yes. yes. Why not prep before you go into that meeting? Take a minute. Get yourself coherent and composed so that you don't have the same reactions and can make some better choices in that meeting. Make sense? Prep is huge. If you really do it... So a lot of the companies and organizations we work with we face board meetings, everything. They start with a one minute prep for the meeting. Let's get coherent as a group. Okay? A lot of our business clients are reporting it's cutting meeting times in half. Okay? Literally. Resetting. Life's life. Right? We're going to get upset in traffic or this or that or whatever's going on. But resetting your system as quickly as possible afterwards saves energy. 
Okay? And then as we start prepping and resetting more often, we now start sustaining our coherence throughout the day in our composure. Again, this is a, a way longer thing to go into this. Here's an example of resetting. So we did a study, in fact, this was just published uh, a couple months ago, with six police departments in the Bay Area, actually. And it's a very, part of the study, they had to go through these very realistic scenarios. We had Moffat Air Force Base roped off and do high speed chases around it. It was a fun study to do. After these, and there were shoot no shoot scenarios, you never knew what was going to go on. These were very stressful for them. We, it was, here we have heart rate up around 100, 180. And this is an officer who's standing still in, our, in a room. In this case, it's domestic violence. You've got the screaming wife over here, the potential bad guy over here. He's just trying to sort all that out. It was not uncommon. We had heart rates up 250, 260 in some of these officers. The main point was that after these scenarios, and they knew they were scenarios, even though they were very realistic, it was an hour and 15 minutes was the average for their heart rates to get back down to normal. Some of them didn't get back down the whole rest of the day, the whole rest of the shift. How much energy just got burned? At a physiological level. Right? Okay, here's what they were, after a month's worth of practice, they could literally reset and reshift just like that, right back down the baseline. Now, part of the study was asking them after the scenarios, the debrief after action review is called, what color was the bad guy's shirt? How many shots were fired? One of these kinds of standard things. It's actually scary how poorly they performed. They were basket cases. If they would shift and reset first, then you ask those questions, they did way better, significantly better. Uh, remembering what happened then and actually answering those questions. So resetting is huge. Yes, quickly. How, how long is the reset? Oh, well, with practice, you can do it in less than a minute. You know, it's a skill you have to learn. I mean, if you don't practice this stuff, these skills, you know, and you get all activated, no, I'm going to try it, you know. Well, it didn't work. You know, you've got to build that familiarity. But it, to really build, well, no, that's, that's going down a different path. But, uh, okay, so energetic communication, that's that second part of the intuition circle I talked about. So we've done a lot of work in our lab, with hardcore measures again, that show that the heart radiates a, well, it, when it radiates a more coherent magnetic field, that can be detected by the nervous systems of other people and animals and so on. So when you measure the electrocardiogram with electrodes across the chest, why is it called the electrocardiogram? What are we measuring? Electricity, right, and the heart's the biggest source of rhythmic electricity in the body. No question. Whenever you have a flow of current, you create a magnetic field, right? High school physics. Magnetic fields go right through human tissues. They're trans we're transparent to them. It's the magnetic component that penetrates things. It's very, very hard to shield a magnetic field. It's almost impossible. That's why radios work and cell phones work inside of a building. <coughs> Okay, so when you measure with electrodes, you're measuring the electrical component, the current flow. To measure the magnetic field, you need a different instrument, magnetometer, right? With today's magnetometers, you can measure the cardiac field about three feet away from the body. The field goes farther, it's just the sensitivity of squid-based magnetometers. Uh, we're getting ready to do some experiments here with NASA that will, I think is using some other process, and we'll probably find it way farther out, single average. So this is this real shape of that field. This actually been, I have a, a book on biomagnetic medicine where they actually measured the external magnetic field and had the shape right in 1884, I think. It's amazing what they were. This, again, it's not new. We know there's an external magnetic field. It's been known for, an eight, for ages. So how many of you had the experience of walking up on a friend or going into a certain environment, you just feel something's out, something's off. Right? You know what I'm talking about? Some people feels really good to be around. Right? We now know that when you take these magnetic fields and do different types of analysis, spectral analysis and so on, there are literally different information patterns and fields that are modulating, riding on those magnetic fields. It's like a radio transmitter. It's like our cell phones. You got a carrier wave, right? Then you modulate it with the information. Same thing. It's the same, same basic way. 